thank you very much for meeting with us. We appreciate your time today. Um, and I guess we should start off. Why don't you just tell us uh, a little bit about your background? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting with you both. Um, so my name is Emerson Levy, and I'm running for state representative for House District 53. And with the redistricting that happens every 10 years, it's it's changed quite significantly. So now it's North Bend, South Redmond, Tumalo, and Sisters, and we feel really lucky that we get to call um, Bend home. And I'm running because uh, I can't afford, and I don't think this community can afford to believe that our best days are behind us. So I'm a mom, I'm a renewable energy attorney, and I'm a school safety advocate. And that's a huge part of my platform. Okay. And, you know, I want to say that I was actually, I was thinking to myself that we had this interview about two years ago, and I was talking about bringing Alyssa's Law to Oregon, and I had started that journey. And today we're working on submitting it um, along with Rep Neuron. And so I, you know, I hope my, the takeaway from that is, is when I, when I say I'm going to do something, I stay committed to it and I follow through and I'll bring that same tenacity to Salem with housing and childcare and education and healthcare and climate change, all of those big issues that we face, I will pour the same energy and same focus um, in, into those big issues. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and when you say you're a renewable energy attorney, what does, what does that mean? So, um, well, right now I am not practicing law. I'm just campaigning. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so when COVID hit, my husband works at the hospital. I have a seven-year-old. That was, that was a good time to, to just shift my focus onto campaigning and being a school safety advocate. But so what I, but prior to COVID, so I work on the financing side of clean energy. So, uh, for example, I would represent the bank that would provide the, like a big, very large capital loan to big energy companies. Oh, okay. Okay. I just didn't, uh, hadn't heard that, um, before. Um, all right. Um, well, let's see. And you did talk about why you were running. So what, okay. You, and you identified priorities, um, housing, climate change. Um, what would you, I mean, could you, Give us a little bit more detail on some of those, um, whichever you choose. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to just go through them or just pick one? Well, or... which, well which ones? I mean, let's highlight a couple, uh, okay. maybe. Um, which, which, whichever ones you want to, like maybe three of them or something. Yeah, that sounds great. So first, I think housing is the most important issue. Um, and, and one of our jobs in Salem is, I think, to truly appreciate how in a single issue is. And when I think about housing and our need to increase our housing supply and grow smartly and, and make sure our infrastructure can support it in a way that is cost effective. I also think about how I just did a tour at Mosaic Medical and, you know, obviously um, being able to staff healthcare is a big problem, but we only have one provider that takes, to my knowledge, there's only one provider that takes organ health plan for kids dentists because the reimbursement rate is, is fairly low. And they can't so then mosaic has built this beautiful facility with six chairs but they can't staff it because they uh they can't find dental assistants that can afford to live here and so it's just an example of how housing is integral to everything and that is why it's my top line issue because we need to have more people be able to live here so that we can have a vibrant community and our kids can go to the dentist if you're on ohp it, it's small things like that or to me it's a big deal that kids can't go to the dentist or have a hard time going to the dentist but it's it just it's in, involved in our everyday life, even if we don't see it at face value. So building more housing, building more affordable housing and workforce housing um, is just top of mind for me. But, what, then, but within that, though, I, I understand its importance um, and how it's linked. I mean, that's a that's an excellent point. But what what specifically should the state do or what what kinds of things would you like to do as a legislator to encourage more housing be built. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that we need to build more workforce housing. So looking at deed restrictive op options, let's say if you're a teacher or a nurse, and so we can uh, reduce permitting fees on the developer side to make it pencil out for them and say this housing is for people who work in our community. So that that's on one side. Um, and, you know, when we look at HB 2001, which allowed for more housing, it's just it gives us more options that people can afford. And I just really also believe in and making it as easy as possible for people to buy a home that they can afford since that is how we traditionally build wealth in America. And just to 
have that option more readily available here. Oh, that makes that makes good sense. Okay, good. Um, did you want to talk about one of the other issues you raised? Yeah, absolutely. So child care is a huge issue for me. I mean, obviously, I was just telling you my story about how I, I, I was forced out of the workforce because it just wasn't practical for us anymore. And so, you know, on the on the state side, what can we do to build up child care? And it's, it's a big issue. Um, but first, it's, it's just like housing, it's so integral to everything, right? People can't find child care, they can't they can't work. So um, there's a program, one of the providers is called Wonder School. This is, there's plenty of providers. This is just a simple example where you know, people go into childcare, not necessarily wanting to do all the payroll. There's just so many difficult things to build a business. And so if it, let's say that you are at, uh, I'll pick St. Charles because they're our largest employer. And they said, we want to bring in 20 kids. Um, and that's what we have space for. Then if, if the state has this wonder school program that's incredibly cost effective, their payroll, their permitting, their insurance, and um, and even the curriculum and all those things that an HR can be with one shared services model. And so you're all sharing an accountant, you're sharing all these things. And so you don't have to worry about writing payroll checks, right? You are just worried about making sure we have a safe and quality childcare. And that brings down insurance costs, that brings down risk costs, all those things. Um, but what's most important is it builds more spaces in a really cost-effective way and really addresses the big problem, which is land and capital, which we don't have a lot of either. So using what we have with, with you know, using the little resources we have and stretching them and making, uh, making it go far. Yeah, that's a great example. Okay. Um, did you want to talk about one more area? Yeah, I would love to talk about water rights. Okay. Um, this also plays into my uh, career because when you finance these projects, you have to make sure all the, what the land looks like and due diligence, the land, the water, all of that. That's been a huge part of my career. And so, you know, we are losing the report that came out said five eighths of our, our, of our water is being lost to climate change. One eighth is due to um, the lack of piping of, of our canals. And then the other was, I believe was Miss maybe Wells and mismanagement. I, I apologize, I forgot what the, the other statistic was. And so we really need to address the way that we use water as we are losing water. And on the state side, you know, what can the state do to address this? Um, I think it's going back and looking at our really archaic water system of first and right, you know, first in time, first and right when the West was settled. And it just allows for so much over allocation of water. But I think when we step back and say, how does this work in the real world? If I am a farmer or I am an ag and I have a loan against my property, which many do, um, the value of your property is built into your, the, the water rights is built into the value of your property. So if I were to give up my water right, I would default on my loan immediately. And so what we could do is the state is we could codify that people could lease out their water rights. And so they have that financial protection and feel a little bit more secure in doing that. So we're sharing the water more efficiently and in a way that's protected. Okay, okay, I get it. All right, that's good. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, well, first, let me give you an opportunity. If there, if you had another, issue in particular you want to talk about, go ahead right now, because I mean, I can ask you particular questions, um, but I mean, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about the priorities that you have. Yeah, if we could talk about school safety for just a little oh, bit, yes, that would yes. be wonderful. Um, so school safety is, it is my full heart and where I've you know, poured into the last three years of, of my life, um, and it's only becoming an increasing emergent issue. Um, you know, when I, I, my daughter goes to elementary school here and after the last shooting, I'm on the PTO, there was a text chain of saying that parents were just sitting out in their car, like sobbing because they were so terrified to send their school kids to school. And I had already pulled over on the side of the road for the same reason, because I was just almost like paralyzed. Like, do I send my daughter? What do I do? And so there's just this fear running through our community, regardless of political party, none of that matters. Like our kids deserve to feel safe in their schools. And so bringing Alyssa's law, which Alyssa is named after Alyssa who lost her life in the Parkland shooting, the whole concept around it is that time equals life. And so when we look at the failures that have happened in Parkland and Texas and, and go back even further, they're pretty much all the same. 
which is 911 redundancies. And so when you expect a child or something to call 911, they're not going to give you accurate information because they're in a traumatic event. Um, second, in Parkland, the video that they were looking at was 20 minutes delayed. And so the shooter was allowed to be in the building for an hour and 20 minutes. So in Alyssa's case, he shot her in the arm one time. And then he because he was able to sit stay in the building, he came back and he shot her again. And so if this had been in place and they had the emergency response system that our kids deserve, she would still be alive. And so um, I just hope to honor her and the work that her mom's done by making our kids in Oregon a, a little safer. And uh, so it's a silent panic alarm that gives an exact location, but it can also be used for natural disasters, lots of things. It's a complete mobile-based system that works as an emergency communication system. And again, it doesn't solve the big issue, but it's a start. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk about. Um, uh, let's talk about abortion laws in Oregon. Um, do you think that they need to be changed in any way? So I I think, you know, over seventy percent of the district is pro choice. If we look back at Measure One Hundred Six, I would say probably even more, but that's just the data that we have based on that many years ago. So this is a pro-choice district. I'm proud to be endorsed by Planned Parenthood. I am very much pro-choice and I, I don't believe that our, our laws need to be changed. In fact, I believe that we stand as a, as a beacon of, of what it's like to protect women and stand up for women and to trust women to make their own private medical decisions. I mean, I have, I have struggled my own pregnancies and pregnancy loss and I can guarantee you the last thing women need is one more opinion on um, when they're going through a very, very difficult time. Okay, yeah. all right. And um, I mean, you talked a little bit about school safety. What about um, gun control more broadly? Um, do you think, I mean, Oregon has, has some rules and regulations and rules and regulations don't stop everything, but is there a particular, um, strategy or regulation that you'd like to see Oregon look at or or do we need to step back from what we're doing or where where do we need to go yeah absolutely I think we all deserve to feel safe and our community and safety is just a big running theme through my um my entire ethos and vision for this campaign and so when I look at what if we can only do a couple things what can we do first I support the second amendment by I come, I'm from Oklahoma or in Georgia, like long hunting families. It's, that's not what I'm talking about. I support the second amendment. What I, my focus is on is magazine capacities for assault rifles. So when we look at what happened in our own community here, you know, over a hundred bullets were fired in a rapid succession. And so if we look at measure 114, that would limit the high capacity magazines. And I think when you look at our community and the state as a whole, that they would support a limitation on the capacity of magazines. That is something that we can do that would that would absolutely save lives um, and, you know, allow people to um, have weapons, but they would be um, you wouldn't have the magazine capacity to cause such a huge um, and tragic event. And the other issue I would say around red flag laws, I think it's really important because we look at domestic violence incidents. That's where a lot of this occurs. And. So I think our red log flag laws are really important, but I also think they're somewhat not that accessible because I find going to court intimidating and I'm a lawyer. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a very intimidating process. And if any lawyer says that they're not like slightly terrified of clerks, I don't really think they're being honest with you, right? You miss one number, it goes back. Like uh, that can be an intimidating process. And so to expect people to go to court and know what to do when they're already in a domestic violence situation, I just don't know how much that reflects the real world. And so um, in talking to people, maybe something more accessible, like through a 998 that would allow for a mental health check, just how can we make that process more accessible that if you're in a domestic violence situation that you don't have to go through this lengthy process in a way that still respects people's due process rights, but how can we make that a little bit, have less friction points, I guess I would say. Okay, that's good. Um, I know um, your opponent has talked and written about the corporate activities tax and how he feels that it should be um, 
repealed in Oregon. I, I may be putting words slightly in his mouth. I know he's opposed to it in general. Um, um, how, what do you, do you feel that the corporate activities tax should be changed at all in Oregon or do you like it the way it is? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. It has come up uh, extensively in this campaign season. And when we look at budgets and revenue and how we how we fund things, I think the important thing to point out is that this budget item funds our public education. And I'm really an advocate for strong, excellent schools and making sure that our kids are prepared to go um, and face the real world prepared. And so um, repealing it would repeal funding. But when we look at budget items, um, what I would say is I'm always open to conversations and I've even had conversations this summer. If there is a place that the tax is not being applied fairly or there's a redundancy, I'm always open to the conversation of looking at that, especially in that short session where we're supposed to kind of look at stuff like this um, and say what's working, what's not. I'm, I'm always open to that conversation. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, as you know, one of the challenges local governments face um, and communities face is, and people face, which is basically what it is, is homelessness. And I, I don't know, um, are there particular things that you think the state should be doing um, more of or less of, or um, how, how do we address that challenge better as a, as a state? Absolutely. I think when you talk about homelessness, I guess that reverts back to safety too. I believe we all will deserve to feel safe in our community, that you should be able to walk, bike, sleep in our community and, and feel safe. Um, so when we look at how homelessness looks in our community, it's it's really multifaceted and, and it's a big challenge. And I'm not afraid of a challenge, but I think it's honest to say this is a big challenge and it stems from lots of different things. So when I looked at other cities that have been really successful in, in what the state does, I looked to Salt Lake City and Houston and Dallas, um, especially Houston, although Houston did not have the help of the state. They had the help of the, of the federal government and cities. And what they did, it was a housing first. So I have talked to people on the campaign trail, and it's honestly, it's like such an honorary campaign because people trust you with your stories. And grows you in a way that I, I can't fully express. But so I've talked to people who live, who work as home health, care, home health care workers making, you know, $18, $20 an hour and that are living out of their car and RV. So how can we take that subset and make sure and, and create affordable housing units? And so when we look at Houston and Dallas and Salt Lake City, they're at a 92% success rate. And the great thing is once you show, show a success rate, it's a lot easier to get federal dollars and Houston's a really good example of that. And so a housing first strategy in a collaboration with county, city, state, and federal government. And I will be honest uh, that Houston has something that we don't and why they've been able to be successful is that their cost of living is less than ours. So Dallas is doing the same thing, but they're facing a more similar problem like us, where the cost of living is higher. And I think that we should be honest about that, that we probably can't replicate at a 92% success rate, stri strictly on cost of living. But Dallas is still being very successful. And so I think that's a really, you know, kind of honest, similar, you know, income and cost of living comparison. And so that's one subset. And then we have, a, then we have you know, I would say uh, other issues of chronic homelessness, people who've been on the street for six months or longer, um, th that's a whole different issue. And so how are we getting mental health services? How are we addressing, making sure that, you know, if we have a, a problem with fentanyl in our community, it's happening throughout the state, but it's definitely happening here. And it's also changing that, you know, the actual formula of it is changing and becoming stronger. And so our Narcan, all the things that we have to beat this problem are starting not to stack up. So that is actually something we can do on the state level is we can increase behavioral health. We can change the code. We can change codes to make sure that people can get more Narcan because you need more Narcan now than, um, than what's allowed. And so just saying this is a very complicated problem. It's not, there's not a magic wand, um, but I am willing to just sit in this and, um, and to really work on it and to make sure that people are safe in our community. Okay. You know, I didn't ask your opponent this, but um, since you're a lawyer, I, maybe that's why it occurred to me. And that is, 
you know, Oregon struggled with its public defense system. Um, and um, that's worrying. It's, it's, uh, and I wonder, do you have, uh, do you have any perspective there that, um, to share? I feel so passionately about this topic. So I actually got my start as a law clerk with the public defender in Los Angeles, so, which is one of the most well-run facil- like one well-run public defender's office um, and district attorney's office. And it's, it's just a very, it's, it has its own problems, but in comparison to Oregon, it, it's, it's quite impressive. So it is a, so I've seen a system that looks so, so different and, you know, I, and the issues that a lot of those defendants are facing are are so big. And um, I realized that I was a person that probably had, I couldn't, I didn't want to take that home. And so I ended up kind of going the corporate route, but I'm so grateful for that experience because it really opened up my eyes um, to a lot of very big issues when it comes to our, our public defense, our education system. Again, when we talk about housing, when we talk about it being integrated, it's also integrated. But as a member of the bar, I received an email from the bar saying that, you know, can anyone take these cases at like 75 bucks an hour or something like that? And I was just kind of stunned because as members of the bar, we have an obligation to, um, you know, zealously defend our clients. And these are complicated issues, right? And so should a clean energy lawyer or renewable finance person be defending um, cases? Is that fair and adequate representation? And I don't think so. So I think we're lacking investment, lacking leadership, but also we're talking, this is a constitutional issue that you have your day in court and that's like bedrock democracy stuff. And when I worked for the public defender's office, what I saw the most, especially in gang related cases, how young these kids are, how young and terrified they are. And yes, some committed crimes. And, and that's why our court system and their system of accountability and restorative justice and all of those things, but they deserve someone to, to zealously defend them and maybe get them on the right track too. You know, what can we do? And so if we can't even top line, get defense, we're not helping them get on the right track to build a better life out of whatever circumstances they found, you know, and, and, and not all, not all defendants, and if we can do better, we should. But bottom line, we have to do better. We need a full, full in, investment and accountability for for our public defense system. Okay, um, I'm taking up all the time, not giving Jerry a chance to ask a question. So I'm going to stop myself here. <laughs> um, Jerry, do you want to? Is there? Yes, I always, I always have a chance to ask maybe one, two questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I ask this question of the uh, Republican candidates almost all the time, but I don't ask it of the Democratic candidates. So I will ask this one, which is simply, if you're elected, how do you work across the aisle with the opposing party? Now, of course, the Republicans have been in the minority for quite a while, but there's some chatter that maybe they might get a majority in one of the houses or maybe even win the governorship. So what, what's your feeling about working across the aisle and getting some laws passed and work done? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's really important. And I think part of my desire to run is to do good work within our democracy. Um, I'm kind of more of a heads down person. Let's just, let's just get work done. And I hope to bring that to Salem. But I would also say that Democrats are not a monolith and we even have to work with each other in our own party and, you know, make sure that we're advocating for what Central Oregon needs, because that's not the same thing that, you know, looks like in, in Portland or Southern Oregon. And so it's also just using those skills and building relationships, which I feel like I've done a pretty good job of building relationships in Salem in order to bring Alyssa's law Um is that that is true within our own party, within the other party, and just a spirit of of collaboration. And I think with the there's going to be a lot of change in Salem. Um, it's just going to look different. And I hope it's an opportunity to remember that we're there to do the good work of the people. Um, you know, substance, not sound bites, is what they say. Even though I guess that's okay. technically a sound bite. But okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Um... Well, what would you say to people who are trying to make up their mind in this race and wondering, you know, they meet you, um, you seem like a nice person, but why should I vote for you rather than your opponent? Yeah, absolutely. Just a little bit about my my background and my story, just um, for a little bit. So I grew up in a pretty 
um, unstable environment. And I know that the good work that the government can do, and I know how it can hold people back. So I got into college, which should be a very hopeful moment, but it was, but when you don't have any money in a difficult family situation, it can be a rather hopeless moment. And I was able to get a Pell Grant. And from there, I was able to go to college, go to law school, met my husband, had a career, you know, had a, had a family and, you know, settled here in Central Oregon. And that all stemmed from good public policy. And so I believe in the good that the government can do. And I also know how it can hold people back. And I also know what it's like to be that, that kid that's counting on someone like me to do their job. But also when we look at what a state representative does, it represents the community. So again, so we look at back to the, the pro-choice issue. I'm the only pro-choice candidate in the race. It's 70% of the community is. When we look at a marriage equality in the country, it's over 70%. And I don't have that statistic for here, but I would imagine that it's greater than 70% if it's 70% in the country. And I am the only candidate in the race that has any track record of supporting the LGBTQ community. And then when we look at our vaccination rates, those are also well over 70%. I'm the only candidate in the race that has a history of supporting public health and science. And so I think that it's representative of the community to bring our shared values to Salem. And I think that's important. And also I'm, I'm a, I'm a trained lawmaker and I'm going there to do the job of lawmaking. And I feel like I've proven with my how I've spent the last two years after not winning a race doing exactly what I said I would do, which is still continue to be a school safety advocate and write laws. And so I hope that that people see that I am serious, I'm committed, and I'm a hard worker. I might not always be the loudest or, you know, but I am a hard worker and I will bring our shared values to Salem. Okay, good. Um, well, is there anything else that you wanted to add that we neglected to ask you something that's important to you, important part of can your campaign? Oh, I have, did we, can we discuss healthcare just like slightly? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to say when we, um, talk about healthcare, it, this has also become such a big issue and just like listening pe to people's stories and, you know, I think it's healthcare. We have to make sure that our hospital here can stay afloat. So that's a big issue for me and, and that they can it hopefully can remain independent. I think that's really important. But we look on the state level, like the state is looking, you know, towards a single payer, but I would say that, you know, the difficult thing about a single payer on a state level is that, um, you know, our goal is always for healthcare to be less, le less expensive, cover more people and cover and better coverage. Right. And so to me, that looks like an expansion of Medicaid because in order to be able to have a single payer system in Oregon, we would need a waiver of ERISA, which is just a federal saying you can do whatever you want to States, you can do it. But I would offer that that's a double-edged sword because if Oregon has a, has a ERISA waiver, other people get an ERISA wa waiver too. And because we increase care, does that mean our friends in Kentucky are going to increase care? It means that they also have the right to not hold up federal standards. And so I think that if we were to move to something like that, it would be better on a federal level. Also for economies of scale, risk pool, all of those things to meet those goals of cover more people for less money, better coverage. And so I really want people to know that I'm such an advocate for our rural health system and working on healthcare will be a big deal for me and increasing our tele telemedicine options because we don't have the same amount of infrastructure here and our 911 services. If you have a heart attack, you should be able to call 911 and feel safely that you're going to get to a hospital. So that will be a huge area of focus for me, um, both on the policy side and just the practical call 911, you should be able to go to the hospital. Right. Okay, good. I'm glad you brought that up. I actually made a note to myself to ask you about healthcare, but I forgot. Um, we were just... <laughs> all right. Um, well, um, that's all I have. Um, it, it, I, just once again, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, no? Yeah, okay. people want to know more. It's emersonvotes.com, Emerson with one M, and on all social media at Emerson, the number four for Oregon. And, you know, uh, 50, what's 49 days till election day? So, um, you know, I'm oh, feel free to call me, feel free to email me. I'm always available um, and always want to hear what's what's on people's minds. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us today and um, for running and giving people a, a, a real race. Um, it's it's a it's I think it's really important in the democracy, as you well know. Um, so thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it and have a good luck in the election. Thank you. <laughs> have a great day. Take care.